Hey everybody, Jack Carr here. Fourth of July weekend is right around the corner, which means that the terminal list is coming to Amazon Prime Video. That's right, Fourth of July weekend, July 1st, all eight episodes drop at once. The terminal list stars Chris Pratt as Navy SEAL sniper James Reese, and he absolutely crushes it. So we have Chris Pratt starring, we have David Agilio as the showrunner who said this in a recent interview, the biggest movie of the summer is actually an eight episode streaming series. Awesome. Antoine Fuqua directing, producing, absolutely incredible cast that includes Constance Wu, that includes Taylor Kitsch, Gene Triplehorn, amazing cast, crew, special operations veterans on set each and every day to make sure that the series stayed rooted in the dark, gritty, primal, authentic foundation of the novel. And I could not be more fired up with how it came out. Amazon was an amazing partner throughout all of this. And uh, I cannot wait for July 1st. So get ready. Things are about to get rowdy. This is the Danger Close Podcast, Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. By the time this comes out, In the Blood might already be on shelves. It comes out on May 17th. My guest today is my friend, John Sanchez. John is a former Navy SEAL who got out and went into the financial industry and then started Team Performance Institute, a leadership company that helps leaders realize their highest levels of optimization and performance. So check them out at teamperformanceinstitute.com. And he is also the reason that I'm sitting in this chair today. He's quite humble about it, but uh, you'll find out in the podcast, if he had not made a very key introduction years ago, the terminal list would not have been published and Chris Pratt would not be starring as former Navy SEAL sniper James Reese in the Amazon series, which is coming to Amazon Prime on July 1st. So that is all due to my friend, John Sanchez. So now without further ado, here we go. Team Performance Institute's John Sanchez. What's up, buddy? You- hey, there he is. Oh, yeah. What's up, buddy? How are you? <laughs> <laughs> you are looking good, man. I, I'm so, it's so great to see you. This is the best. I, I tell you, I've been looking forward to this for so long. This is the best. Well, man, I mean, it's long overdue. I mean, gosh, I mean, you're the unsung hero of my entire post-military life. Negative. You know, you, it's Negative. true. It is a hundred percent true, and uh, we're gonna get into all of that. So, what, so you—is this your podcast studio? Is this in the? This is, yeah. Is this in the house? In the office? No. Where are you? This is in an office about fifteen minutes from my house. It's in a nice. cool, like, uh, let's see, like a uh, what was that shopping center that was near? That was outdoor. Um, fashion downtown. Valley. Oh, down, yeah, downtown. Something like, downtown. Yeah, something it's the like other fashion one. The other one. Yeah. yeah. If this is the Cincinnati version of like that. Like we're above a Victoria's Secret, a Jake's Toggery, like all <laughs> these are cool retail shopping. There's sushi restaurants. There's all this cool stuff, man. Nice. Um, okay. So is that, is yeah. that the headquarters, the world headquarters uh, yeah. for Team Performance Institute? Or that's is that right, just bro. podcast? That's, nope, that's the whole this thing. Is, this is headquarters. We have in here, we have this studio through that wall. We have a full on like training studio where we do online virtual learning. Uh, we have a coaching room and then we have office space. And then we have like these kind of cool areas. We have we have a, a war room that I dedicated to Doug Zumbeck, who was one of my classmates who was killed in 07, where we get stuff done. We have a huge conference room out here. It's You got to come check it out. It's small, I want to see it. Yeah. It's small space, but it's really functional. Super nice. fun. Uh, we enjoy coming to work. It's super fun to be here. So you're bringing people in. You're bringing groups in because you were traveling for a while. I think you're still traveling, but are you bringing still groups traveling. into you now? Still traveling. We're bringing groups in now. Our new product that we're going to do. Well, first of all, like if you have like a, a corporate team and you want to do like a, you know, a, an offsite, you can come in here and we'll bring it. We also brought in, we did an executive leadership summit where we brought all these like really high end executives in. We brought them around the table. They could work on them, you know, work on their own leadership styles and, um, and we also have a bit of a boondoggle, right? We take them golfing and we take them like, you know, yeah, to the yeah. spa and all that stuff. Um, Gotta our make new it products, fun. Gotta make it yeah. fun. But we're doing workshops now where people can come here and work on their own leadership. Nice. That's so, a new product. Sorry. What's... 
What's that? What's the new product? Sorry, I cut you off. Oh no, it's uh it's like a it's a personal leadership development three day. You know, come in, work on your stuff. It's called real leadership. It's resilience, like you know, and resilience is all about finding your sense of purpose in your life and what really makes what really drives you, what brings you to work, what makes you excited. Evolution is the E in real. That's about being a change agent, you know, learning to adapt and deal with change and lead through change. A is for attitude, which is all about working on self and building up, you know, building that out in yourself. And that's the choice that you have. And L is legacy, which is like the why to your character. What are you leaving behind? What's really important in life and getting people really in touch with, with all that. And the legacy rolls back into that, that resilience purpose piece that we do. So it's kind of this holistic look at, um, you know, at building up people. Nice, man. Nice. So you do, like a lot of people, they they do their time in the SEAL teams. They're kind of like, they get out. Maybe they do a couple things here and there, and then they find out that hey, I'm gonna go and share my experience uh, yeah. on the speaking circuit through a book, through a leadership seminar, whatever, whatever it yeah. might be. But you had a way different path than that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. SEAL team. I want to get. I want to talk about your path up to the SEAL team before I get to why you're responsible for the terminal list. Uh, and by default, the show that's coming out on Amazon prime with Chris Pratt. So you're, I mean, you are like, you're like patient zero, uh, of, of all of that. Um, but, uh, but yours was, was different because after your time in the SEAL teams, you went into finance, uh, very successful there. Uh, so you had that for, for a number of years, but you had this passion for leadership. And yeah. so it wasn't just like a, Hey, what can I do to make some money here? Well, I guess I can, you know, capitalize on some of the things that I learned in the military and apply some of those leadership principles to the, you know, the private sector or, you know, that sort of a thing. I mean, you were all in on finance crushing. Um, and then you just, you were like, it's time to make a change. And I want to, I want to, I love leadership. I love teaching people. Yeah. I love uh, mentoring people along. I love passing. So it was a very, it was very different than most of the other people that I know with, uh, with military backgrounds that get into a similar, similar space. But before we get to that, uh, I don't really know that much about the young Johnny Sanchez. Like what <laughs> got you to the Naval Academy? What was that path to the Naval Academy? You know, that's a good question. Um, and looking back, I realized that I had a lot to learn way back in the day and what was going on. So young me was young and very motivated. My um, older brother went to the Naval Academy. I walked down to the Academy grounds. If you ever had a chance to see the Academy, it's, yeah. you know, it's really impressive. Beautiful. Uh, right after my eighth grade year, going into my freshman year of high school. So I started, I looked at the Academy and I thought that's where I want to go. And I did not question that for about two and a half years. Highly motivated young guy did everything. I tried, tried to do everything right in school, tried to do, you know, stay away from all the bad stuff, you know, stayed away from all, you know, drugs and all that stuff. And just really motivated swimming student council, you know, tried to do the best I could. I had really good grades, all that good stuff. Got into the Academy, really excited. I got actually early acceptance in the Academy. I got in like September of October, of my senior year. Wow. Um, yeah. That's a good move. Yeah. I look back. I was like, I just turned 17 years old. So I was just over like, like 16 years old when, wow. when this happened. And, um, why do you think they want to do that? Like that early when you're putting in an early package like that, um, what was the one or two things that stood out? Was it the athletics part or was it the, the student council part or is it the grades? Yeah. Or was it just like, you're just the whole package. Like how could they not accept I, you early? You know? I don't know. I think, you know, I think having like family legacy there, I think it's a lot harder to get in now yeah. than it was when I got in. I mean, it, I, I was very lucky. I played water polo. I was, being recruited for the water polo team. That was probably certainly helpful. My brother was a player on that team. Oh, wow. And so I think I had some, I had a couple, uh, let's be honest, a couple legs up on, uh, on getting in there. And um, yeah, so I got in. Did you even apply where, anywhere else? Or were you like, done, <laughs> mic drop out? Were you good I, or did you apply to some backups like Princeton and Harvard? Yeah. You know, it's funny that you should say that because I, I applied to two other schools, um, one was St. Meinrad's to be a priest, believe it or wow. not. Yeah. I think I did uh, know this. I think you told me that. A yeah. Time ago. Wow. So, I mean, the call was to serve and it was to serve earlier. And I was trying to figure out to Catholic high school and I wasn't sure. I also applied to University of Rhode Island because they had a really good in um, German engineering program, which I was attracted to. And I thought that would be, that would be pretty cool. German um, engineering. Yeah. The funny thing about being accepted though, was I got in and I chickened out. I actually was like, when you look at it through the eyes of a 14 year old, right? When you walk onto the Academy grounds your first time and you see uniforms and you see people, you get motivated around what your perception of the military may be. 
for a 14 year old brain, you know, digesting all of that. And I thought, yeah, man, this is exactly where I want to be. I want to be with all these hard, you know, hardcore dudes. And I want to get after it. Um, at the age of 16, 17, I was, and I got accepted. I was thinking, man, I don't know if I can commit. It was like a four year Naval Academy and then a five year commitment. I remember thinking, man, it's forever. I'll then. be 27 years old. I'll be an old oh. man by the time I get out and, mm-hmm. and nobody will even want me. You know, yeah. I was like, this is going to be. <laughs> so I was like, man, this is crazy. So I, I chickened out. I decided I didn't want to go. I, I told my parents I didn't want to go. They were floored. Uh, they were like, wait, what? We, you know, we basically, um, I'm one of six kids and they were thinking I was definitely on my way to the academy. And, and, uh, and I, I had some real hard moments. I had some real soul searching in, in a two or three week time period. I was really trying to figure out what I needed to do. And it came to me in a moment. I thought, you know what? It's actually what I really do want to do. I had to I kind of had to dismiss. I think I had to get rid of everybody wanting me to go there. Everybody was, you know, I was kind of molded into that. And then I realized it's got to be for me. Like this has got to be 100%. Like if I'm going to go and I'm going to commit to something, I want to make sure it's in line with my character, my values, who I am and what I want to do. And as soon as that came into line, I was like, yes. So I went to my dad's office. I'm like, dad, I got it. I want to go to the academy and he smiled at me. He's like, it's too late, man. Your, uh, your letter has like, it's been rescinded. It's, it's past its deadline. We don't, <laughs> we don't, the Naval Academy needed to know like, you know, two weeks ago. And I was like, floored again. I'm like, oh no. He goes, well, I got good news for you. Your mom forged your signature and she signed you up. <laughs> no way. No so, way. Right here. That's awesome. On the Jack Carr podcast. I'm, I'm <laughs> making it making it official. I illegally joined the U.S. Navy. No kidding. Yeah. That first thing, that first signature means it's all, yeah, it's all for naught. It's all rescinded. Man. I'm all in. That's I'm crazy. In. That's awesome though. Yeah. Man, and did you know at that time that you were going to be a SEAL, you wanted to be a SEAL, you wanted to try out, or were you like, was it just the academy and water yeah. polo and that experience, or you had you thought past that into, oh, maybe I can fly, or I can be a SEAL, yeah. or I can do these other things, or well, yeah. how far ahead were you thinking at this point? Yeah, at that point, it was just the academy. At that point, I was thinking, I just want, and this is the same advice I try to give to young kids who are going in right now. It's like, just be the best you in the best place that you are right now. Like, try to get around the best people. And just execute on this. So if going in as a, you know, I just trying to get through my freshman year. I struggled there academically. I got exposed to, and the Academy did a really good job of this. They exposed you to all these cool things throughout the summers. I really loved hanging out with the Marines and being in Quantico and getting my boots dirty and all that. Um, but then I got a small taste of the SEAL teams. I went out for mini buds. I don't know if they still had mini buds when you were yeah. at the command. But I got out for a three week mini buzz and I'm like, dude, this community is where I belong. And as soon as I saw and tasted a just a small sip of the SEAL teams, I could not, couldn't keep me away. I did everything I possibly could. I gave up all my summers. I did no leave throughout four years of college, um, with the exception of, I think, about two weeks I took off. Um, so I went to airborne school, uh, you know, I went to scuba school, I went to mini buds, I did every possible credential I possibly could to, to, uh, you know, load my package going into my interviews for, for the teams. And I was lucky enough to get selected and lucky enough to uh, be able to try out. Well, if you didn't know that much about seals or weren't focused on it, um, going into the Academy and then early on, uh, how did you, how did you get into the mini buds class? I thought even that was competitive. Yeah. How, how did Super you end up there rather than like, oh, I guess I'll just do uh, my summer tour in the med or whatever they do. I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah. But how did you yeah. even get into mini buds? Um, so you had to try out for mini buds. Mini buds tryouts was probably the physically the most demanding thing I ever did. It was harder than hell week in terms of the, the intensity of like the three to five hours they would give it to you. And then you get a small break, and then you go after it. I mean, it was brutal. And that's um, on Academy grounds. And it's just, uh, for those listening, yep. it's a, a little tryout to go to something called mini buds where you're taking people. I'm not sure if it's just from the Academy. I think it, it might be just from the Academy and you no. go to, but it's, oh, it's from other R- NROTCs yep. as well. So yep. NROTCs, Naval, uh, yep. uh, reserves officer training corps, um, yeah. things in different, con- different universities around the country, but you show up at buds for a week. Yep. And you go you through like your three own, weeks for three weeks. You go through, you go is through one of those phase, weeks, like a little mini hell week, or how does that, what's your three is. weeks like? Yeah. You go through phase one, phase two, and phase three. You get put with all the different instructors in oh, each wow. phase. And for those, you know, for I'm those sure they around. loved getting you guys there. They, oh my gosh. Can you imagine? <laughs> they just love beating up uh-huh. wannabe. We're, we're not only wannabe seals, 
We want to be officers. The <laughs> worst, the lowest you can possibly be. Uh huh. It, <laughs> it was brutal. <laughs> you remember an instructor named Jaco? Uh, Chief, Chief Jaco. He was. I, I remember uh, somebody else talking about him. I can't remember if I actually crossed paths with him or not, though. Amazing dude. Amazing guy. Um, he was one of my my brother's buds instructors, and he happened to come in and guest instruct. He did like a thousand like um like neck exercises in one direction. I'll never forget it. Cause like it was hard to ride in a car for like two weeks after that. It was like, I've been in a car accident. <laughs> anyway, it was a rough, it was a rough three weeks. It was amazing though. Cause I got a taste of it. I saw the community. You can still see the culture. Not that buds is the culture as you well know, but it was like, this is where I want to be. I just knew it. Like from that point on, I'll do everything I possibly can to, to get there. Did you have quitters in mini buds? Like, were there people from these different training programs or from NROTCs and from the Academy that were like, Oh, peace. I'm out already. Let me say, let me yeah. save you guys some heartache here. I'm out <laughs> day one week. It was, one. Uh, I think it was good for the instructors to see because all these guys were, were the ones selected that they're eventually going to get the package for. And mm-hmm. so they could look at them and say like, that guy doesn't really belong here. So it's a uh-huh. good weeding process. I can't remember anybody quitting. I remember guys getting hurt just in those three weeks and kind of being on, you know, the sick lame squad and, yeah, and yeah. not being, not really being with it. When I can't, man, it's so long ago now. I can't remember yeah, yeah, yeah. anybody <laughs> actually reach quit. back 25 years, 30 years, whatever it is. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Exactly. Man. So that, then going back to the Academy, um, uh, the, there's the selection just to go to mini buds. So what was that? What was that like? And how many people didn't make that? Yeah. Our, I think our initial meeting for my class to go and say, you know, who, who has basic general interest for the SEAL teams? I think it had a couple hundred people in it. It was mm-hmm. one evening we went out to say, hey, and this was no different than any other community. Like if you wanted to be a pilot, go to this, you know, go to this evening, like, and we'll have a bunch of pilots talk to you about what it's like to be a pilot. So I would guess up two to 300 folks were initially interested. By the time it got down to going to, you know, mini buds or trying to try out for mini buds, it's about a hundred guys were very interested, showed up. And that was a, that was a gut check session. They yeah. came after us super hard and super fast. And it was something that I didn't, ex- didn't expect, but I also was, I welcomed it. Cause I was, I was kind of excited to, uh, you know, to be, you know, you know, you can remember all of a sudden, like they just turn up the heat and you look around, you're like, Oh, this is what it's all about. This is happening yeah. right now. We're going to find out who's who right here. It's like a fight starting, you know? Yeah. And, um, and I got a bunch of guys quit, you know, yeah. a bunch of guys punched out of that pretty quick. By the time we got down to, and the real hard part was we had about, about 45 guys that were very qualified, like extremely qualified from my Naval mm-hmm. Academy class um, that whether they got to go to mini buds or not, by the time it came for what we call service selection, by the time that they, they make the decision on what profession you're going to have in the Navy, we had about 45 guys and only 16 positions that were available. Mm. And I, you know, my heart still goes out to the 30 guys that didn't get selected because they were strong. They were good. They were smart. I would take any single one of those guys. We were just the lucky ones, the 16 that were cho- lucky or maybe unlucky when it, when it came to about yeah. six months later, right. <laughs> we were getting tortured, but right. literally tortured, but it was fun. I mean, I mean, it was fun to, to be that young, be selected mm. for something. I felt like I was, I felt like I got drafted by the NFL, Yeah, you know, you know, to be going in as an officer. And I also had a brother, he was at SEAL Team 3 at the time. And so I I could see the other side of the fence and I knew what was waiting for me. And that also helped me a lot, to be fair, helped me a lot with training. Because when you know the other side of it and you know that these instructors putting you through this, everybody's playing a role. Everybody's, you know, everybody's working and you have to show that you're able to work and do what you need to do. Wow, man. Did they fly out instructors for you guys or did you have like a dive motivator or whatever it was called at the time uh, attached to the academy full time? Or did you have him and was he augmented for that, uh, that, that session? Yes. They, had, uh, they had an enlisted advisor who's a SEAL full time at the academy. They had two lieutenants at the time that were uh, both, uh, I think, two or three platoons each. And then when we went to do this training, they would bring guys, some of them maybe stationed uh, in D.C., Mm. bring guys in to, uh, to fire up. But a lot of the times as you're going through the mini buds selection, they would bring like the senior class in to get after the junior class, the guys who had actually been through and were going to be SEALs. So when I, you know, when I was selected for SEALs, I got to put the next class through and that's almost, <laughs> that's almost worse because those guys just have really no, uh, no filter and they're just all, all fire. 
you yeah. know? Oh man, that's so wild. And uh, I mean, so you go through your, your plebe summer before you go in, you're going to airborne school, you're going to scuba school, you've done your mini buds, all that sort of a thing. Um, through that whole experience at, uh, at the Naval Academy, do, does that, does mini bud selection stand out or does that plebe summer stand out as far as uh, letting, making you question anything or as being like, wow, this is, this is real or this is very difficult or did you have a problem with anything going through? Cause then you're throwing academics on top of that. They're throwing you in the boxing ring. Like every, I don't know if people know that, but every, you know, they might expect it of West point or whatever, but for you guys, like you throw you all in the ring, like you're, you're in there, you're fighting. If you've never fought before you're in there with your classmates and, yeah. and it's really cool. But, um, uh, anything stand what stands out, uh, in your mind yeah. over that four year period, uh, before you graduate and head off to buds. Yep. I think, the things that stand out the most for me, like all the physical stuff was really fun. So we had to learn judo, we learned boxing, we learned wrestling, all that stuff was like super fun. I enjoyed that. Um, I think the best team, um, if I look back on my experience being on the water polo team and, and, you know, eventually becoming like the captain of the team and working and being with some of these just great people that were really working hard. That was, that was tough. And I became closest to that team. The thing that sticks out as the hardest was the academics. Yeah. I got my butt kicked the first three semesters. I came in all hot shot from high school thinking I had had it wired, realized it doesn't matter what I want to do in the Navy. They're going to put me where they want me in the Navy. That's, you know, I'm going to end up on a ship somewhere, you know, scraping paint and if I, if I even graduate. So academically that stuck out as probably the hardest thing. And it wasn't until I figured myself out, figured out how to study, figured out how to, I was studying really hard, but I wasn't studying effectively. I wasn't getting yeah. after it the way that I should. And it took me a while. Yeah. Um, but I learned and, you know, yeah. moved on and finally was able to, by the time I was a senior, I had it wired again. I felt really, okay. really strong. And it's not like a lot of colleges where you can go in and be like, eh, I'm going to stay away from some of those uh, engineering courses. I'm going to stick it more, stick more over here to some English lit and a couple other things. Like, <laughs> like you have to go and do those engineering courses, don't you? They make everybody yeah. like suffer through all that, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Everybody has to take all these weapon systems, engineering, electrical engineering, physics, like everybody has to graduate. You graduate with an engineering degree, although you still might have, it's like, called like a bachelor of science in one of the arts. You could graduate with English. Now they have foreign languages. Uh, they didn't when I was there. Um, I I studied economics. I really kind of enjoyed economics, but nice. I had a bachelor of science you know, in economics. And I you know, tell people I got C's in pretty much every engineering class. So I could, I could build a bridge that would probably crash if you try to drive over it. <laughs> well, the economics thing comes into play later, but, um, so you go to buds and, and make it through first time and head off to anything in buds trip you up or was more difficult. I mean, the swimming you obviously crushed, were you a good runner in the soft sand and good on the O course? And yeah, physically I was set for buds. I felt yeah. really good about, about coming in. I think the Academy prepared me really well for that. I felt, um, you know, water polo. I mean, that's just six to eight hours in the water at, at a time. And you're, I felt really good the thing that really tripped me up at buds. People ask me like, what's the hardest part of buds? I'm like, well, you know, you can look at like hell week and say that's, you know, and clearly that is a brutal, awful week. And that was difficult. I don't want to make, you know, light of that, but, um, I started my buds class. I was the only officer when I started. Uh, in the class of 100, we only had 140 guys. Now the classes are much bigger, but 139 guys and me, week one, day one. And I went through the entire buds, all six months of buds as the only officer and graduated. Wow. With, with, with that class. That's unusual. Usually yeah, somebody's going to roll in from, they got hurt in second phase or third phase and they roll in at some point or it's not, that's unusual. That's amazing. Yeah, it's crazy. So people ask me like, what was the hardest part? I think it was like the leadership, right? Be leadership is extremely lonely, but when you're by yourself, no classmates, no friends, no peers. And I went through, you know, the whole thing. People ask me, what was the hardest part? I said, pretty much the whole thing. It hurt once <laughs> from the beginning <laughs> to the end. One you know? big hurt. Oh, man. Yeah. So, yeah, but it was fun. I mean, I, I should, it was, it was so challenging and so good to be, I mean, I wish, you know, in terms of leadership, can you imagine going through as a young 20 something and having to navigate those waters as the only officer in a yeah. class throughout three sets of or four sets of instructors, yeah. right? Those are huge, you know, mountains to climb every time you class up with a new, a new phase. Right. And it was fun. I mean, fun in a way that is extremely challenging. I wouldn't want to go back and do it again. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> You've had <laughs> sufficient. Yes. Um, that's how, so you go through those, 
six months, you get there a little ahead of time, the preset stage, and then bam, first phase, second phase, third phase. And now you graduate. And at the time, SEAL qualification training or SEAL tactical training, STT at the time, yep. is yep. run by your team. And you go to team three and you don't have to go to Benning, right? Because you've already done that before. That's right. So yep. at the time, most people, most classes would go to Fort Benning, Georgia for jump school for those listening. Uh, it was a great time because now you're in an army environment and that trips you up in some some ways that <laughs> make for some great stories later. Um, but you didn't have to do that because you already had that that qual. So you go right to your team and you walk across that quarter deck by yourself because your class is at Fort Benning uh, learning static line. That's right. Yep. Showed up at the team. And once I got to my team, that was the one I got super fun, right? That's that, that STT at the time, SEAL tactical training. That's when they really teach you how to be a SEAL. You're a brand new guy. So you go to the bottom of the totem pole and get a team and you're used to it by that point, but they actually train you. They actually care. They really want you to get up to speed. And we had a great training cell. I was at SEAL team three um, because, you know, Southeast, Southwest Asia, you know, wanted to be over in the over in the Middle East. I was really excited. We had desert, you know, desert camis were like super cool to me at the time. I'm like, this is going to be awesome. That's right. Um, Cause you guys are the only ones in those, right? It was a, it was different yeah. per team. Yeah. That's right. Team one only had their jungle camis and you know, you team five guys are all winter warfare and jungle as well. Most, mostly but, uh, shorts and t-shirts, flip-flops at team five. <laughs> <laughs> team three was about you to had to be prepared for volleyball at any given moment just for anyone <laughs> listening you're at team five yeah for the east coast guys sorry about that <laughs> yeah so you do that seal qualification training is it right off the bat or do you have to wait there and like work in the op shop or something like that yeah i actually got to um i got to compete because they're they, they had to class up we weren't classing up another like you know stt class i think for six months so um can't remember when i got out when I got out of Buds, I think I went, no, I went to SEAL tactical training right away. I did. And yeah. then after that, I, they, uh, they had me compete in the military pentathlon, the Naval pentathlon again. So I got to compete at the, uh, international level to compete in the pentathlon, that which was fun. Crazy. I remember you did the pentathlon team. I didn't know it was so soon off the bat. Uh, yeah. so you get there instead of putting you in a platoon, they throw you on this pentathlon team, which for those listening, yeah. I'll let you go through the events, but you're kind of out of sight, Adam, it's kind of like the jump team, the leapfrogs. Yeah. Like you go yeah. somewhere, you're doing something, you're jumping out, I don't know. But for yours, you go and you train on this own little obstacle course that they have on the other side of base and you have your own little yep. area over there. And what yep. are those events? So it's the trippiest thing. The Naval Pentathlon is five events. It's two obstacle courses. Um, well, it starts off with an obstacle course is your standard like military obstacle course. Not actually, nothing standard about it. It's 10 obstacles, extremely difficult. Most people can't even get through this obstacle course. Like, yeah. like a couple obstacles will just totally trip them up. Um, and, and then there's another obstacle course on foot. There is a two swimming, uh, um, two swimming events. One's called Life Saving, which you swim with like camis on. You have to strip them off and save a, uh, save a dummy. There's a finning race where you fin underwater. And then there's a rowing and cross-country race. Uh, it's like, it's one of the hardest, <laughs> hardest things I've ever done, but it's, it's five events. Um, it's, it was founded by the French and it's called the council of international sports of the military. You know, it was founded after world war two. And the idea was after world war two, as we know that, you know, it was just awful. That was supposed to be, you know, the end and it was supposed to be the end. we shouldn't see a world war three. So they developed this council for military units to compete against each other, uh, every year or every four years in a world games to come together, compete against each other. And it was called friendship through sport. And little benotes to me, I was like a young Naval Academy guy and I, I got selected to go do this. Um, at the time it was Admiral Smith, God rest his soul. He just passed. And uh, he was very motivated on winning this. We hadn't won it in 10 years. And so he, he scouted a big team. He asked for like the top three athletes from each SEAL team. And then he took the top three Academy guys and I got to try out uh, to do it. And it was really, really fun. It, you know, caused some, some angst among the SEAL teams. They were like, we don't want to give up three operators, mm -hmm. you know, to go do this sports team. Um, but it was a pretty cool intro for me into the teams and to see what it's all about and to work and make some good friends, you know, make some really good experiences. We got to go to Rome. We competed in Rome. We actually won uh, gold medals in Rome, which was really a nice. really wild experience. And wow. uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Does it yeah, rotate really around amazing. different countries? Get it, Kind of like the Olympics? Yep, it did. And then in between like deployments, I would get pulled and I would be asked to do it. I went to Rome, Pakistan, and Sweden. To you did it three the, times? I did it three times. Yeah, I did it three times. I got two gold medals and uh, I think, geez, I don't even remember. I think I got a bronze medal. I can't even remember. What I happened on that team. one? Yeah, as a team, I don't know. Yeah, we kind of fell apart in Pakistan. <laughs> that is crazy. 
Man, that, that, how many people are on that team? So there's five people that uh, make the final team and an alternate, but okay. about uh, about 15 people try out and do the training camp. Okay, the training camp's about three to four months long. Nice. Um, that's Super great. Cool so, experience. and so you said it, it started after World War II, and I can I can only assume that it that Pakistan was not one of those countries that was initially yeah. uh, <laughs> had a team. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> is it, as time wore on, like more countries join it, kind of like NATO, yep. very similar to NATO. <laughs> and it was it was trippy because we were doing this in the '90s, and you know there are Iraqis that were there that we were competing against. Wow. And you know we were we were like literally living with them in the same barracks, the same dorms, and you know. The Russian team was there and the you know Turkish team was there. And I mean, it was wild. I mean, it was absolutely cool to um, kind of see the, the whole, the whole idea around the, the, the friendship through sport really did take off. Unfortunately, you know, what we're seeing in, in the world environment right now, I mean, you know, unfortunately history can repeat itself, but uh, I thought it was a really neat experience. Interesting. Actually it seems like a good spot for, uh, foreign intelligence services to spot and assess, possibly recruit, um, yes. <laughs> Maybe some, maybe some counter intel uh, training or a counter intel PowerPoint might be a, yeah, uh, a good thing exactly. to do before they shoot you guys over there. Interesting. That's exactly. amazing. So you come back That's from cool. that. You've been away from the team. You get back and they toss you in a platoon. Is that, is that yeah. how it went? Yeah. So many go in regular workups. Um, you know, got in the platoon, did a couple exercises, had fun. You know, your workups get to go overseas. Um, you know, work with some of the best. You know, the story. Some of the best guys in the world that you get to work with. And did a, uh, you know six months overseas, had a blast. Uh, it was hard as you know, as you well know, um, kind of back and forth doing that, doing that lifestyle for a while. Did you go to Bahrain? Is that your first deployment? I or? did. Yep. Yep. First point I, I lived in, uh, I lived in Bahrain. Didn't have to take a ship over there, which was okay. fantastic. My claim to fame is like, like 10 days on a ship in the Navy. I have the same. Uh, I think I've nine. I think I've have you beat by one day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I got to fly everywhere and nice. I got to operate. I got mm -hmm. to do all the good stuff. And then, um, as luck would have it, it's towards you know towards the end of uh, end of all that. I uh, you know I met Anya. I met the you know the girl of my dreams who was in medical school. And uh, everybody asked like, was it hard to get out? <laughs> no, not for me. I was ready to go. My call of service, you know, um, which pulled me into the teams. I had this mm -hmm. real strong sense of purpose, which was to serve. Same call that pulled me out, like to yeah. go be a good dad be there as you know had kids be there you know for those like you who served 20 all the respect in the world for what you're able to do have children you know for your wife who is you know who stays home I mean, man that's just incredible amount of respect i wasn't strong enough to do that i really did want to be there uh, i really wanted to challenge myself another way and that's what got me into financial services and and that whole world. Yeah. I mean, so. you were a little too smart to, uh, <laughs> to stay in. You, you knew that it, that's important. I think no matter what it is in life to listen to that calling. And like, for me, it was really easy also, like an easy is the wrong word, but, uh, just to know when it's time and to yeah. listen to that. Like I knew that calling in life that um, serve my country in the military seal teams, uh, I'm going to write after that. Like I knew those things cause they were callings. Uh, and I think both yeah. the professions also. So the profession of arms, you know, it's not called the career of arms, uh, and same thing yeah. with writing. It's a profession, not a career, which I yeah. think is, a, is an important differentiation. But, uh, yeah. so those years in the, in the teams then, um, what, what lessons did you take from that? Cause you're pretty prepared by that first platoon. Mm -hmm. When you get thrown in there, I mean, you've competed here yeah. internationally in the pentathlon, you have the academy training, yeah. you have all that stuff. And, uh, and you're in your first platoon. What did you take away? Did you have a good platoon? Was it a good experience off the bat or do you have some leadership issues or what did you, uh, what was your experience like in that initial, initial pump? I think I had it all. Yeah. <laughs> the smorgasbord of leadership. I did not feel like, so one, I did feel prepared for the completely unprepared. So what am I taking away? Huge adaptability, right? Like being I think being the only officer in my buds class was really good for me because I learned how to just be a leader, step up all the time. You always have to be at the ready as a leader. You never know when it's going when you're going to get that call where you have to step up significantly. And uh, and I was there, so I got to do that. That was that that was wonderful. Um, you know, things go down on deployment, which you have complete like zero control over. And I think what I take with me from lessons learned is like there's just so much ambiguity in the world. There's so much, you know, it, it, you just, as much training and, you know, how much money the government spends to make a Navy SEAL to put us through everything we've been. And then all of a sudden you end up in the middle of, of, I was in the middle of Africa and where we were like, 
we were getting attacked by baboons one night because we had I had bed down my platoon in like a baboon breeding ground. <laughs> like, what is That's this awesome. Like, like you wake up in the morning and you're getting attacked by baboons. You're like, <laughs> There's no manual for this. There's right. no like, you know, um, so it's just, it's just wild. So I take that with me. Um, and you know, another thing that was, was really cool, but also hard is like, as you, as you develop as a leader, you, um, you, you, you start to see everybody in terms of, where they are on that leadership journey. Mm. And sometimes, and this was difficult for me, is some people let you down. You know, there's leaders that even in the teams, I had this huge glorification of, of the teams and, and we're all human. Mm -hmm. You know, I let, I let people down, right. Uh, as a leader and leaders let me down and just kind of, you know, I, I kind of walked in probably just young and, and thought of the teams as, as a utopia. And I, I got to tell you, there is no utopia. You learn to, you know, you learn to come together, learn to figure it out, work hard together, and you have to be willing to fail and willing to, you know, work really hard to get back up in leadership. And that, I think that's, that was one of the biggest things I've learned time and time again. It's what helps me, you know, day to day as I go through my day to day right now. Yeah. And, man, and, you, and uh, what about going over to the Middle East? Like, did they prep you at all? for that, like language, culture, any of the things that started to play in later, they're just like, yeah. kick you out the door. And for those listening, there's a lot of institutional knowledge at the time because yeah. you had your teams and there were three at the time on each coast, essentially. And uh, you would focus on an area of the world. So you have team one going to Southeast Asia, you have team three going to the Middle East, you have team five preparing for North Korea uh, kind of contingency. And there's some overlap in there as well. And then on the East Coast, you got two going to Europe, you have four going to Central South America, uh, you have eight kind of the med, North and Africa, that sort of a thing. So you were, you were focused, but you had these guys that stayed at these teams for five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 15, 20 years that have done a ton of deployment. So you have, I think I would venture that we had more Thailand specific experts than anywhere else <laughs> <laughs> just, just uh, because of the environment. But, uh, but point being, you had these people that had been going back and forth. A lot of them learned, the, took, took on learning the language because they were there. They maybe they went and spent a little time at the unit, like a logistics hub that we used to have in these, in these areas and then come back to the team maybe. Um, but then after September 11th, when we were on that force 21 and we became each coast was worldwide deployable, deploying as teams all at the same time, all of a sudden you have, you don't have that institutional knowledge, uh, when we're focused on a country or region of the world anymore, but you, right. you guys had that. So you had that at that time, you had people who had deployed to that area before. And I guess they just thought that they just passed this stuff along to you kind of just word yeah. of mouth. Um, but what was that like going into that, uh, those different, that, that, that culture without much prep? I, I I was completely unprepared. Yeah. I in, in retrospect look back, I felt like I was prepared to be a warrior, prepared to do all the stuff that they taught us to do. Every box was checked in the, the pre-deployment work list, right? So all the jumping, diving, you know, blowing stuff up, all that stuff was good to go. But it, when it came time to culture and, and and figuring out what was going on, we went over there uh, during Ramadan. Like actually, Ramadan kicked off right in the beginning. We had really no clue. I think we got about a two-hour brief going before we went into country with an expert over at, um, over at group. Right. So we went up with the whole platoon, went over to group for about a two hour brief on like, um, how to shake hands. Mm -hmm. And that was about it. So I think at that time, and this is like a million years ago, I just felt, I felt like, okay, got it. Um, but I was, I look back now and realize how underprepared I was yeah. for the culture, you know, the culture shift and what we did over there. Um, yeah. Do you guys get to take some cool trips on the, on those deployments that you did? You get to go work with like uh, some of the, uh, the special operations forces in the in the Middle East, and uh, we did. Do you have to pack the parachute for a prince of any of these countries or any of that? Do you have that experience? Yeah. We did. I spent some time with actually my, one of my favorite trips because we were up like you know up in the up in like the real hot desert Africa. We actually got to come down into Kenya, and one of my favorite trips. It was like almost being on safari because we were working with the Kenyans, and it was moving from like. You know, from Northern Africa to Central Africa is dynamically different, right? You're, you're really, you're changing religions from, from one area to another. You're changing terrain. You're changing like an entire season. And all of a sudden I'm embedded into Kenya. And these are like some of the happiest, most awesome guys. They didn't have any money when we were coming out of an, or, you know, an area that had tons of money. And it was just cool to be around. They really were, they cared genuinely about us being there. We got to work with them, train with them. When we were training up in, you know, up in Egypt, it was very different mm -hmm. than training in Kenya. So Egypt, it was, you know, I just didn't, 
didn't feel like they even cared that they were there and they tried sometimes to steal our stuff. And they, they always, they always knew the answer. We got the answer. We don't need you. And you get down to, to Kenya and the Kenyans were just so hospitable, so fun to work with. They really cared. They really, really prepared. I remember one night we were getting ready. We we're, you know, we trained with them for a few weeks and yeah, you know, a small exercise, but fun. And, and we were getting ready to, um, Put them through a, an FTX, like their final, you know, field exercise that they're going to do in front of their command. And their commander came to me and was like, "Couldn't sleep." He's like, "Help me! I need to like prepare for tomorrow." I'm like, oh, "I got your back, man. I got this." And he kind of walked him through every part of the exercise. So I'll do it the next day. Just watching him kind of go through it, and just you know, because I got to be an observer, watching him do all the stuff we had trained him to do for three weeks, and just watching him go through that. I was like, "It's a real cool sense of pride." I think it like it kind of drove me into what I'm doing now. I was like. Oh man, it's awesome to teach and to help people, you know, get to the next level. Nice. So that was cool. Yeah, that was fun. But thanks for thanks for reminding me. I you know, sometimes <laughs> I look back on that deployment, I'm a little bit like, ah, oh, that was tough. I didn't like it. But yeah, there were great, great parts of it. Nice, nice. Lieutenant Commander James Reese, can you outline the details of your mission? This was a targeted attack. My timeline is a little fuzzy, but they knew we were coming. Headaches, paranoia, memory confusion. This is set up. I think I'm losing my mind. It's David versus Goliath. Which one is Reese? David or Goliath? I'm still working that out. When you decide to to get out, when you're like, okay, uh, you meet your future wife, and and it's very clear to you that it's time to to move on and uh, and start that next uh, that next chapter in life. How long is it between when you make that decision and when you can actually get out of the military? Yeah, it was it wasn't too long. Yeah. We met about my last year in the teams, um, and it was you know, came back from a deployment. I was like, yeah, I was ready to go. Met her. She was in medical school at the time, and we were really trying to coordinate how do we spend as much time possible together. Um, and we met, it was just like love at first sight where I was like, I'm going to marry this girl. I know it. Um, I think when we got married, we actually had probably spent less than a month together by the oh, time wow. we got married, just because of the oh, deployment schedules yeah, yeah. And, and all that stuff. Uh, so I thought I, you meant it was a month later. I'm like, man, nice. Oh, no, 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 no. It was, uh, I, I proposed, man, if I go back in time. So I met her proposed by the time we were engaged. Uh, about a year before I got out, but you know, we had, you know, I'd been back and forth to the middle East uh, a few times uh, while we were still dating. And she was just a trooper. She was an absolute trooper. She wanted to stick it out. She said, I would, I'll happily stay in with you if you want to stay in, but I was reading the tea leaves. She was in medical school. She wanted to you know, dedicate her career to that. And those are some, as you well know, like those are tough, tough, tough years. The first, you know, four years of residency are really tough. So we made the command decision as a couple to say, "Hey, let's do this." Nice. And uh, and I and I got to pull the plug. And again, I didn't. I don't mean I. I miss the guys. I miss you. I miss being you know around guys like you every day. Um, but I've got to assemble and build my team now, which is like the most fun thing I can do every day. I'm just excited to get to work. Yeah. Team Sanchez, baby. That's right. So yeah. awesome. So yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, did you have to do a staff job in there while you were waiting or did you get to just leave right from the team? I did an ops job ops. for a while. But at a team? Uh, that was an interim ops at like team three. Okay. That wasn't the official ops. But they, they sat me in the ops seat, which is pretty cool, you know, to see like, wow, that's, that's really how it works. Um, you know, eight platoons running at a time and I got to see operations at a high level and that was fun. It was just an interim job, um, but it was very high. It was a good highlight into uh, what you see yeah. at that level. Uh, you know, a lot of phone calls in the middle of the night, coming into the command in the middle of the night, making sure everybody's okay. Right. You know, knuckleheads getting in trouble here and there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know the nights. Yeah, oh, yeah, you man. got it. And then, uh, and then, where do you go from there? How do you know that uh, that that finance is your path? I mean, you had the obviously you were interested in it earlier on with uh, with what you studied at the academy. But um, when do you start looking into the different options uh, that are that no. are available there for you? 
Yeah, I, actually, I didn't. I didn't really know. And again, this is where I think we've come a long way in veteran transition. I really wasn't sure where I wanted to go. When you transitioned out, I was like, uh, yeah, you want to go this direction? <laughs> I want to help. And, and you did. I was, I <laughs> and was you did. I'm really, going to get to that in a second. <laughs> well, I was just really motivated to help. And probably because of the of, of, of my experience, because when I got out, I was like, I don't know what I want to do. I'll put my, um, I went to, a, I went to a recruiter and this recruiter found me and he's like, yeah, you know, we, you know, he listened to me and he's like, I told him I want to be entrepreneurial. Like a job recruiter want, person or like a, yeah, like a military, you know, military recruiter, not military recruiter. I'm sorry. Like a, yeah, a recruiter that like will place junior officers yeah. in corporations. Is right? this a super secret Academy thing or is this like military wide? No. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't like a ring thing. <laughs> No, it is not a ring. I didn't, I didn't wear my ring just for you. Just for you. Jack. Thank you. <laughs> just for you, buddy. Um, no, it's like uh, they have a lot of these cool veteran organizations that help veterans who are getting out and basically say, hey, look, you know, if you're getting out, what skills do you have and how can we apply those to corporations? So they have all these connections. I went there. They just they just plugged me into an organization that I did not care about whatsoever. They didn't really listen to me. They said, boom, here you go. They gave me an operations job. I was an op- I went from being a SEAL team like platoon commander to be in a dude wearing a hard hat and an operations paper plant with a clipboard, like making sure orders got out the door. It was the worst, like worst, like that um, is crazy. <laughs> well, that sounds, that's a fantastic laugh. optic for a movie or a show or something like that. <laughs> like remember Brad Pitt and spy game when they're like, when Robert Redford wants to recruit him. So he makes sure he gets in that like horrible, like admin thing. And he's like, that's like, exactly that's it. what happened. <laughs> exactly what happened. I literally, and all my guys, you know, all my friends, you know, we're all thinking about getting out, staying in the teams. And I got out, I was one of the first guys I got out and, and like, how to go? And like, how's that? How's your job? I was like, I quit. Like, you did what? <laughs> I said, yeah, I quit three weeks that I quit. Weeks. It wasn't a, it wasn't a good fit. And, you know, and then again, lessons learned, like you adapt, you overcome. I, I put my, put my resume online. And I uh, got a few calls from, I got a call from like Merrill Lynch, from like Smith Barney and Morgan mm-hmm. Stanley and went in there, looked around and thought, this is cool. And I actually, it was the book that I read. So my books make a difference mm-hmm. here, big guy. Mm-hmm. The book that I read, it was written um, uh, by an insurance guy. It was called The Excellent Investment Advisor. Huh. And it's an old book, but it basically it was getting in line with your purpose. And my purpose was to, again, serve others, help others. And this book was written around, hey, if you do this, if you work really hard, you can help everybody get through probably the second most important thing next to their health is their money, help them manage their money, help get through this. And I thought, okay, I got this. I can do this and I can be motivated to do that. And I was excited about about doing that. It was uh, the lifestyle that, you know, it's kind of the fun, like the, the Wall Street glamour and all that stuff, getting out and trying something trying something. I had no idea what I was doing. I honestly had no idea. And I got in and I had to cold call thousands of people. And again, I went from being like the cool guy to the guy who interrupts your dinner. And I had to cold call thousands of people had to try to build business, build trust, get around the kitchen table and, and win over trust and have somebody sign over, you know, all the money they've ever worked for to me to manage, um, which is a great, great challenge. I had a great wow. time. I, I, I enjoyed that challenge very much. Um, enjoyed building the business, got to be, um, again, I started off not successful and then I had to adapt and overcome to, well, what do I got to do? In my first six months, I think I had like my parents' account, probably not all of it. <laughs> it <was Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, Trust, but we'll just see yeah. how this works out first. That's crazy. How, so what did, how did, did they give you like a three week training thing and then say off you go or like, how did that, how did that work? Yeah, how did you know that? They literally gave us three weeks in New York City. They took us <laughs> up to New York and they're like, here you go. And this is what you do. And, and again, I was like overly confident. I'm like, I can do this. Yeah. And it wasn't until I I, um, I was failing and I knew I was failing and I had to I had to figure it out. I brought on a mentor, uh, this awesome woman. Her name is Debbie. And, and, I, and I just, I loved her demeanor. I loved how she laughed. I love how she talked to her clients. I love how she was just very real. And so I walked into her office. She had a couch in her office and I sat down on her couch and I said, you've been chosen as my mentor. And she said, I wasn't aware we had a mentoring like, you know, program here. I said, well, we don't. And I just chose you. I just need help. And she's like, well, let's do this. And so she totally helped me. She's like, well, you know, show me what you're doing. She went on a couple appointments with me. She watched me stumble through and try to work. And then she just held my hand and like, let's do do this. And I, you know, I attribute a lot of my success in in that financial world 
to her because I got I was then able to build a significant business and I you know built it up and enjoyed it and it was really cool. It's what helped feed my family for the next twelve years. Yeah, that's me. And I forget you guys moved out of San Diego, right? So you're fairly fairly soon after you got out. That's right. Got that's right. Yeah, yeah. Anya got her residency in Baltimore, so we went to Baltimore for her to do her residency at uh, in Baltimore, and that's where I started. Uh, my financial practice. Okay. And then you, you, then you migrate out somewhere else after that, right? Where Chicago. You, there you go. Yep. There you so go. that's where you really build it out, right? Is that kind of where you really yeah. like yep. start running? That's where it expanded and grew. Nice. So Anya then decides she gets a, she gets an MBA from Georgetown and then we moved to, she got a great job in Chicago. Wow. So her job took us to Chicago. We She's an underachiever there. as well. Oh, I know. Yeah. I mean, I'm the, oh man, she's just great. So I ended up I was like, I do not want to move. I just built this business. Why do we got to move to Chicago? She's like, well, that's where my you know, job opportunity is. And so kind of kicking and screaming, I go to Chicago after three or four years, after like three years in Chicago, I said, if we stay here one more year, I'm never leaving. I love this city. Really? This city is awesome. Uh, made some really great friends there. Uh, best friends there built. That was when the financial practice really got to be exciting. Got to work with some, some guys my age. We just had this great running crew that we went around and built business and had a great time. Um, had two more kids while we were in Chicago and it was just absolutely wonderful. So by that time we had three kids and that brought us back here to Cincinnati, Ohio. Yeah. Um, when did you decide to make that move and, and what was, uh, what was behind that, uh, that decision? Yeah. 08, 09 world was coming to an end from a financial standpoint. Uh, we had three kids. We had our third baby in Chicago in the middle of the winter, <laughs> no support. We had, two sets of loving, awesome grandparents that lived within two and a half hours of each other. And, uh, thinking, you know, what are we doing? Let's go. Let's, let's get back to family. Let's get back to home. Let's get back to our roots. And, uh, we pulled the plug, uh, came out and we, uh, we searched and found a farm. Um, it was our dream kind of living that we would do. And we found a, a nice little farm, a house on a hill, and we went for it and we, we were lucky to, you know, we could write a book on that one. That was about a year long process of doing that during a financial meltdown of 08 or nine, but we, we were, we were able to, to, to move into this house and raise our children there and be close to the grandparents. And that was 12 years ago. So that Amazing. was just awesome. Incredible. Yeah. And you're at, and uh, are you still doing financial stuff though at that time? You're still, you still just kind of transfer what you were doing, but you move it over to uh, to Ohio area. That's right. Yep. Moved it over, moved it over to Ohio. I actually built up the business big enough in Chicago to sell it and moved and moved it in a new company here in Cincinnati. I did that for about five years and then I wanted to get into corporate management. And so I got recruited by a bank and I was really, again, inclined, called to serve. Uh, one of the bank presidents was absolutely awesome. She said, you know, if you want to do a little bit more with your life than just manage money you should look at this. And I did, and I got to be a team leader. So I got to run two financial teams and one in Dayton and one in Cincinnati. I got to work with some really highly qualified people, but we also got to be involved with the community, like really, you know, be giving back into the community and the bank did a really good job with that. So we really got around the heroin epidemic and homeless veterans and all the cool stuff that I got to be involved. With. That's when I started getting into like getting on boards and, you know, seeing the much bigger picture to, being a you know community leader involved in the community, um, which is really really exciting. So again, it was just that you know team performance institute. We have this thing uh, called rules of engagement. Our second rule of engagement is just surround yourself with the best people possible. Yeah. And I felt like I got to do that initially at the bank, and then through that made so many other community um, community uh, you know uh, relationships yeah. that now I'm able to do what I'm doing, but a lot of that, I'm going to put, point the finger back at you. A lot of that is actually attributable to you, Jack, for, uh, you know, helping me get started. So you think this is me helping you get started. You had a huge part of helping me get started because while you were still in and while you were being hamstringed by the teams, you asked me to come and help a little bit, come out and do a couple speeches here and there, which turned the light on for me that that was something that was actually doable. 
that's crazy because I was going to ask you about about that and ask you like the first time that you got up there to do a little do a talk and was it was it the bank or was it what how did that work and then we have some fr- mutual friends uh, in Cincinnati area that uh, that uh, are also interested in the community and helping and giving back and all that sort of a thing um, so we had that connection there there as well but um, was it like the first time you went out to do one of these things where you're like hey it's going to be a one off two off I'm still part of leading these two teams I'm still got my hands in in finance and and all the rest of it but when you started to do those talks, at some, was the light bulb go off right away? Or were you like, hmm, I'm going to, what, what, I'm not enjoying this. If I can pass somebody, yeah. I'm making an impact. You can see it. Like, like what, what was that journey like? Yeah, that journey was, um, that journey started with me talking to like Cub Scouts, right? Like, like, like that's when my son got off the, you know, when he was in first grade, he got off the bus sweet little guy. And, 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 he, and he said, daddy, I'm going to be a Cub Scout. And I looked right at him and I said, me too, let's do this. And so all of a sudden we got to be, and all of a sudden I'm speaking to these little Cub Scout groups, these little girls soccer teams. And then, you know, somebody said, will you speak to my you know, like high school football team? Like, yeah. And I just kind of fell in love with the idea that, Hey, you know, we can, at this stage and age in life, you can look back on some of your experiences and, and be proud of them, but you can also give them back to the world. You can make those experiences relatable to others to help them and project a higher trajectory for them, help them get to where they can be, help them reach fuller potential. Because, you know, game's over for me. I'm, on the, I'm in the third quarter. I'm having a blast, right? But I'm not going to, you know, that trajectory is, 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 is kind of set. Now I can help others. So it started with that. And then it, somebody came up to me and said, hey, will you, come speak to my company. And I said, sure, I'd be happy to. Let's let's meet with your company. Let's talk about what they're dealing with. And I'm happy to do it. And I did all this, you know, prep work. And then I went and spoke with the company and they said, how much do you charge for this? I'm like, I don't, I don't charge anything for it. I love doing it. This is like my passion in life. And they're like, well, you're an idiot because you can, <laughs> you can charge for uh, this. And, uh, and that's about the time that, you know, uh, you were being hamstrung a bit by, you know, by the teams and, you know, my heart went out to you with your family. And I knew that you were looking to support your family, you know, in, in wonderful ways. And, um, and that's when I think that's, I think it was one of the first times I got out there and I, you know, I, I think I, I met you out in, in San Francisco. And, uh, if you recall that you spoke to about 20 people out there, there we go. the there famous go. Jack Carter, those guys would be so psyched to be in the room right now. Make, no way. This is so you spoke to about 20 people in a little That's tiny conference crazy. room and I sat in the back and I took notes furiously and, uh, and I thought, okay, so this is how it's done. I get it. And so <laughs> I was just making so, it up also. Uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Isn't that wild? That's crazy. So that's, so that's my memory. So I mean, now I go I remember back to this. thanking dude, thanking you. And so I was like, all right, cool. And then, you know, there was a couple that you couldn't do and I got to go out and, and do those for you in your stead. And it kind of turned the light on. I was still working in the banking community. Yeah, yeah. Um, but all of a sudden I realized this is something that I could do. It had to translate from, you know, from Jack yeah. Carr's story to John Sanchez's story, you know, and it's, those are totally different stories and totally different experiences. But um, I was able then to translate it into what's now the Team Performance Institute, which is what I always wanted to be. It's not like the John Sanchez Institute. It's not like, you know, John Sanchez. It's just a matter of like, helping others achieve next level development. We're just really trying to help teams and others gather around it. So that's amazing. Um, yeah. So you helped me. I mean, I, I oh, throw man. it right back at you, my friend. Oh. You really helped me get this thing off the ground, kind of get it started, make a lot of connections. We were talking about y- young YPO groups. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was cool, man. So thank you for that. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Somebody asked me to do it. Somebody else, another team guy was doing it that he got deployed or something. And he's like, bro, will you go and do this thing for me? I'm like, yeah, sure. Uh, but same thing. I hadn't really sat down to think about leadership. I was just doing it for the longest time. And I remember when yeah. that happened, I was like, okay, I'm just going to take a minute to sit and think about this. So I thought about, hey, you know, why have I been quote unquote successful as a leader in the SEAL teams? And it came back to trust. And so I just threw this thing together, yeah. trust and leadership and how all those other principles yep. that I talk about uh, take trust weaves through all of them. Cause I was thinking about all those things as a leader that maybe I did or what I learned along the way or how I adapted or evolved as a leader over time. But throughout each and every one of those principles or tenants, there was this theme of trust. And so whether that's like a two minute conversation in the hallway as you pass somebody in the morning, or it's out there on the obstacle course with the guys, or you're, you know, going through a stress course on the, on the range, shooting pistols or M4s or whatever it it might be, or you're in a brief, um, it's building that trust up and down the chain of command. And every single 
interaction is an opportunity to continue to build that trust because you can certainly lose it quickly. Um, and That's every right. opportunity has to be um, leveraged to build. It's an opportunity to do that. So um, yeah. yeah, no interaction is too small as far as, as far as that stuff goes, but that is awesome, man. And then in yeah. there, in there at some, at some point you were like, you knew that I was going to either, I told you or our friend Scott Grimes told you that, uh, that, uh, that I was going to write, I wanted to write novels. And that was my thing after I, I leave the military. Um, and I forget if I told you or, or he told you, and, uh, and I can't wait for you to read the new edition of this. So it's coming out in, uh, June of the terminal list and there'll be three new editions that come out. Uh, two will have Chris Pratt on the cover for the series. So a mass market paperback, uh, which is like the smaller paperback and then a yep. trade paperback, which is the larger paperback. And then they'll be reissuing of this. And in this one, in the hardcover, there's a new forward written by me that talks about how this came about and you have a starring role. And so I can't wait for you to read it <laughs> when it's, uh, when it comes out. So it'll be this cover with, with some, uh, Amazon specific, uh, copy, you know, on the front, the other ones you can tell they're there obviously cause there's Chris Pratt's face right here. Yeah. Um, yeah. but this one will look similar, but it'll say like Amazon prime or something here, but this one will have the new, the new forward. The other ones won't. And, uh, it talks about how, how you were like, you found out that I was going to, uh, going to write novels. That was my passion. And my mission was to take care of my family. And my passion was to write. Like I knew that. Um, That's right. And, That's right. uh, you were like, Hey, uh, do you know who Brad Thor is? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I know Brad Thoris. I've read, read all his stuff. And, uh, you were like, Hey, do you, do you think it'd be helpful to you if you, if you had a conversation with him? <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah. Would he talk to me? Cause I didn't have any connections to publishing Hollywood. No, none of that. And, right. uh, and you're like, yeah, let me set it up. We sat next to each other at a, uh, a foundation event for one of these military, um, uh, That's right. it was Marcus Luttrell. Oh, wow. It was actually Marcus Luttrell when he was out no doing a uh, lone survivor book tour. Oh, that I met Brad Thor. So he's sitting next to me at Marcus Latrell. This all comes full circle, wow. brother. This is crazy. So I'll tell you how, I'll tell you my, my recollection of how this yeah, all yeah. went down. I didn't put it so, together that it was Marcus Latrell's. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm gonna have to say thank you to him. I'm gonna do that when, as soon as we're off here. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so Marcus does this book tour. He's in Chicago. So I'm out in Chicago and and Brad lived in Chicago at the mm -hmm. time. And I sit next to, we. I got invited to go, you know, to this uh, awesome, you know, uh, Marcus's talk and book tour. And I'm sitting up at one of the front tables and this guy is just talking and talking and talking to me. And I realized, I didn't know who he was, to be honest. I had no clue who he was. He's just talking and I'm like, hey, dude, like, it's Marcus right there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. And uh and it happened to be Brad Thor. And, and afterwards, I was like, oh, my gosh, that was Brad Thor. So I reached out to Brad. What a great guy, That's great Brad. individual, incredible guy. Brad's wife's a doctor. My wife's a doctor. We both had kids about the same age, both live in Chicago. We just became fast friends. So we we hit it off, not in the stardom like type thing, but just simply like, hey, man, let's just hang out. You're just a super dude. And let's be let's be friends. And his, you know, his wife, uh, Trish, she's absolutely awesome. Anya and Trish hit it off young kids. And we just have this cool, this cool world. Fast forward a few years. And here is my great friend, Jack, who says, Hey man, I'm thinking about, you know, doing something. And, and this just goes to like, just goes to show, like, if you surround yourself with good people, that good things can happen. Right. And so I talked to Brad and I said, Hey, Brad, I would love to introduce you to this guy, you know, uh, bro, now, now go back, just go back about 30 seconds you had developed such a reputation in the team, such great trust, such a stone cold, amazing operator, but more important to me, a solid, wonderful family man, like a, a guy that everybody trusts, everybody loves. You can't look at Jack and think, no, nobody, nobody said an ill word about Jack Carr, right? And I know you will deny that, but that is the truth for everybody listening, because with that reputation, I was happy to go to Brad Thor and say, hey, um, I got a guy that is absolutely incredible. And I think you should meet at the very least talk to him. You know, he wants to be an author. Now, Brad told me, look, I get a lot of these calls, man. Like, you know, everybody wants to be an author. Yeah. But let me tell you something. <laughs> let me tell you something. This goes back to an earlier comment you made. This is a profession. I dedicate my life to this. And I knew that from being friends with Brad, that like there are just months at a time where I couldn't get a hold of him. Mm -hmm. He was under deadline, he was moving and he is a very intense individual. He's very successful. Um, but he just, he was getting after it. I got it. So I said, yeah, I, I said, well, I, I don't know what Jack's writing will be, 
but I will tell you, he is a professional when it comes to, you know, when it comes to this, it is a profession and he is a high end, the highest end professional that I'd ever meet in the teams. And so I highly recommend him. That is when I exit stage right. And then the great story happens. So I'm honored to have a very small little puzzle piece to this, to this book and honored that, uh, honored just to be, you know, just be talking to you today. Oh, dude, are you kidding me, man? That's, I mean, that's a huge piece of this puzzle. Uh, without that, nothing else happens. And uh, so when I wrote that forward, when I wrote it to the, the new edition that's coming out in, in June, I was so excited for you to, to read it and to send you one. Um, and that'll be coming here as soon as I, as soon as I get the early copies, but I didn't want people to read it and just be like, Oh, lucky, 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 lucky. Okay. Boom, boom, boom. Ah, it's right. all luck, you know? Um, right. right. And so, so I wanted to make sure I framed it in a way that, uh, that wouldn't discourage people. And be like, well, hey, I don't, right. I don't have uh, someone that knows Brad Thor. I don't have someone that knows Chris Pratt, or I don't have somebody that, you know. And, and I didn't know that I that I did, obviously. Um, so I talk about it in terms of everything else that you're building as this foundation. Because had I not had that reputation in the SEAL teams, you would have not risked your political capital with Brad Thor to then say, hey, I want to connect you with this person. That's right. Um, That's right. So I wanted to frame it that you have to put in the work at all these different levels. Um, so that when the time comes, when randomly your friend happens to sit next to Brad Thor at a Marcus Luttrell, uh, speaking event, um, that, that he feels that it is worth that political capital to make that yeah. introduction or whatever it is, you know, that's just, it can, it can that's be exactly right. That, that connection was going to get made. Right. That connection was going to get made. And our first rule of engagement here is be the best you in the, in the, in the current moment, uh-huh. right? Be the best you in the current moment. So that's you. You're just being the best you could possibly be in the teams, not knowing that an author career was, was coming. A substantial, crazy, amazing <laughs> career was coming. Uh-huh. And nobody knew it at that time. What? And that was really exciting. But again, like it's just, it's just about you being a good person, wow. Jack. It's about you. It's about you doing the right thing time in and time out. And it, it isn't luck. I got to go back to what you said because people say, oh, that's, that's just lucky. You just happen to be right place, right time. You can go back and put you, put anybody in some of the situations that you've been in in life or some of the situations that I've been in in life and they would not consider any of those lucky. In fact, there's almost, almost zero way out of them. And, uh, you know, and in that, you're all right. So, but you, you were trained enough to get there and then to be able to get out of them and to work hard. I think, you know, you create your own luck in life. Um, but if you stick with it and here's, you know, I have a son now who's really considering, you know, the military, like, man, if you just stick with it time in and time out, you're going to end up in the right place. It's going to look completely different. There's not much control to your future, believe it or not, except for what you can control internally. And that's just being the best person you can possibly be. Today, there you go. Today, and you're not going to have it. Or sometimes you'll be working at like sixty percent. Well, then be the be the best sixty percent you got. There you go. You know, because it's yeah. So anyway, it's 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 all attributed to you, my friend. Oh, you, man, well, you absolutely crush it. And I can't tell you how fun and exciting it is for me, because people finish your books, and then I get all these phone calls. <laughs> hey, I saw your name hey, in the back. <laughs> hey, you you know, you know Jack Carr? <laughs> I'm like, yes, I do. Yes, That's I do. Awesome. I'm always like, I'm driving the car. I'm like, yes, I do. I know oh, Jack Carr. And it's just the greatest thing. I'm like, man, he's awesome. I love his stuff. I love his podcast. I love all that he does. And I'm oh. just thinking, man, what a cool, what a cool little connection, oh, you know, yeah. that, 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 that created something really great. Jeez, well, I'll never be able to thank you enough. And that, and the second and third order effects of that is that now fast forward a few years, during a pandemic, when people are uh, kind of worried about work and, and especially in Hollywood and all the rest of this, you put, because of that, 350 people are on set and people just think of Hollywood as the A-list actors and the director, maybe a producer and, you know, some crazy speeches at the Academy Awards or Golden Globes. Like that's the, that's the vision yeah. of it. Yeah. But there are, so that's, let's say that's five people on a set. Well, there right. are uh, 345 other people on that same set making that all happen. You know, the hair and makeup people, the mobility people, the stuntmen, like craft food services, security, like everybody that's on that set making that making that thing happen. They're just trying to put food on the table for their family, and they're trying and they are the best at at what they do. That's that that's that type of a team at that at that level when you're working yeah. on something like this. It's like yeah. it's like a Lamborghini where one of them like that, that's why now I understand why that you can only, like they have the guy that just plugs things in or whatever that is, because if someone else is doing that, that means they're not doing their thing. That's keeping that Lamborghini going at 200 and whatever miles an hour down the track. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. cause if you're not doing exactly that one thing that you're the best in the world at to tink, to tink, to tink, to tink, you know, things start to go 
to go wrong. Um, right. And, uh, but all those people had jobs for that seven month period, uh, to include a writer's room beforehand and then post-production afterward, uh, because of that. So without you, those people's lives <laughs> are different. Uh, I mean, it's just amazing how those, the, the ripple, uh, effect uh, impacts so many people beyond, uh, where, where you, what you think it will. Cause you think it's going to maybe affect me maybe, but now we have all these other, other people, especially now that it's a show, uh, that, that we're impacted by it as well in a positive way. So it's just, yeah. it's just too cool beyond words. It's man. really, really cool. You got to thank like, you know, Brad Thor for taking that call. You yeah. got to think there's so many other people. So it's not just me and you, like you said, there's so many other people that are open to the idea looking to genuinely go in the right direction and help others. And, and great things happen. We get to put food on tables for, for tons of people who are also yeah. doing the right thing. Just gives you, it just, it's just wonderful. It gives you hope. Amazing. Amazing. And, and uh, I know I've told you this story before, but uh, it's been a while since I, since I, I told it to you. So you set up this call and, uh, and I'm up in LA when the call, when schedules allow when Brad's schedule allows, right? So wherever I am, when he can do it, I can do it. And, uh, yeah. so I have my old Land Cruiser, uh, which, uh, had not been redone by Icon yet. So, uh, the air conditioning might not, <laughs> not have worked very well. I remember that. I remember that old car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember the old That's one. That's the one. Yeah. It looks one. similar, but now there's a little, now it goes a little faster, but, uh, so I'm in <laughs> LA and I go to the corner of this parking lot and I remember exactly where I was. I can totally picture it. And the sun is just beating down on this thing, but the windows are all up because I want to be as quiet as possible, which is difficult in a 1988 <laughs> vehicle. You know, it's not like soundproof quite yet. Uh, so I'm in that thing, windows up, the sun is just baking me. I have this yellow legal pad. I have my pen, like I'm ready. I'm ready. The call comes in, you know, do the call and I'm, I'm taking notes the whole time. And it was like a job interview. It was, uh, you know, Brad wondering why I wanted to write. Um, because I think the answers to those questions or however that discussion went, he would be able to decide, well, okay, uh, am I going to introduce this person to Emily Bessler at Simon and Schuster, my publisher and editor or not? Do I just give him the kind of like, ah, oh, keep going and, you know, find an agent and uh, that's what you should do. Um, so we have this conversation and we talk about my mom being a librarian and I talk about the, my history and reading all these authors growing up and I'm, you know, talking about them, talking about Clancy and David Morrell and Nelson DeMille and AJ Quinnell and Jesse Pollock and Mark Golden and all these guys that I read growing up. And then, uh, the people that I found later, like Stephen Hunter and Daniel Silva and Brad Thor. Uh, and so I'm talking about all this and this, this history, uh, really that I built up as a reader, as a fan, knowing that I was going into the SEAL teams and then knowing that I was going to write thrillers. And eventually he's like, Hey, okay, stop talking. Like he's got, he's got to get back to work. He's got, to, he's got to finish a book. Like you said, he's on deadline. He's like, stop talking. He's like, uh, okay, uh, got it. Um, because, uh, he's like, I've never done this before, but, uh, because of what your friend, you, uh, told me you did in the SEAL teams. He's like, uh, I can introduce you to Simon and Schuster. I can let them know that it's coming. I can't guarantee they'll open the package. I can't guarantee they'll open, crack the page. Definitely can't guarantee that they'll like it. But, uh, as a thank you for, uh, for what you did for the country, I will let them know that it's coming. And I was like, that is all I need. And he said, when's it going to be done? And I said, one year from today. And uh, he's like, all right, don't call me. I'm not going to give you any advice. I'm not going to help you with any chapters. I'm not going to let you know what I think. Uh, but if you finish this thing, call me back in a year and, uh, and I'll let him know it's coming. I was like, Roger that. So I put it on my calendar for the next year. And exactly a year later, I call him back and uh, said, it's done. And then this is the super cool part. He was like, is it, is it done or is it the best that you can possibly make it? And I was like, well, it's done. I was like skidding, you know, skidding through the finish line and just to get it back so I can call him back when I said a year to the day. And, uh, and I said, well, I could probably edit it a little bit. I could read it a few more times here and tweak it here and there. And he said, all right, call me back when it's as good as you can possibly make it. So then I spent the next four months just reading and rereading and editing. And then when I got to that place where I thought, hey, I could spend the next 40 years on this, but it's only going to get better by a degree or two. Uh, I was yeah. like, okay, that this is, it's time. And so called him and yeah. said, uh, all right, here, uh, it's, it's as good as I can possibly make it. He said, Roger that I'll let Emily Bessler at Simon Schuster know it's coming. So in that initial conversation though, I managed to sneak in, uh, like what, what margins should look like and, and what the spacing should be and what, uh, what font, uh, do you use type of, yeah. so I put it in that yeah. exact thing that Emily Bessler liked at Simon and Schuster. I knew she didn't like it bound. I knew she liked it, a stack of paper. So like, exactly the way she would get something from Brad. And so sent it to her and, and Brad thought he's told me since that she was going to call him, like read a couple sentences, maybe a paragraph and call him. Cause she's got things to do and uh, say, oh, yeah. Brad, I read it. You know, it's not, I don't really want it. It's not that great. Yeah. Uh, what do you want me yeah. to do? And uh, he thought that's the call he was going to get. 
Instead, she calls and says, I absolutely love this thing. Uh, incredible. I want to buy it. Um, what do you want me to do? Because you're our political thriller guy. And this yeah. is so cool. Which is like, a, which is a bit of a like, almost a conflict, right? Uh, yeah, a little bit. But it, this is the great part. <laughs> what he, uh, is that he says immediately without even hesitating, he's like, I want you to publish Jack. And yeah. that was so cool. The greatest. He's like, greatest. but he said, just don't publish him in the same month that I come out. <laughs> that was awesome. But uh, so Brad calls oh, me yeah. and I'm on the side of the road in Texas. It's a thunderstorm in Texas. I'm coming back from a hunt and I pull over to the side of the road and he's like, and it happens to be a raining thunderstorm. And he says, uh, you, you've just been struck by lightning. <laughs> I was like, uh, and he's like, she wants it. So anyway, that's how that happened. And uh, that crazy, is the greatest. Crazy. That is the greatest. Oh my gosh. So I got to see and feel it from the other side because I was talking to Brad throughout that time. So I get the phone call prior to you talking to Brad, you know, and you talk to him. He's like, he's like, oh, I'm going to call. I'm going to call him. We're going to get this. I'm going to say, well, yeah, I said, dude, he's the man. Oh. Just, I just want to tell you, he's the man. So, you know, of course you earned every bit of that. And then that whole year goes by, I'm in touch bad. And he said, you know, we're waiting. We'll see it in about a year. He comes back to me and he's like, dude, it's amazing. Uh, like it's a hit. It's huge. I can't like, I've seen this happen over and over again. I've never seen anything like this. And at that moment, I think you called me and you're like, oh my <laughs> goodness. Cause that was about time. Emily called yeah. you. Like I got struck by lighting. Okay. So Again, I'm just, man, it's just such a, it, thank God that that happened. And, and then it goes, and then it goes to number one. Crazy. Well, like it's uh this is one of the number one. So uh, the, the whole series has, so uh, devil's hand was number one. Uh, yeah. Uh, Savage Sun was number three on the list. Um, and then the other ones all hit the list as well. When, when Savage Sun hit. So everyone's been a New York times bestseller now. Um, this next one coming out in the blood right here, the early reviews are that it's uh, it's the best one yet, which is was, was amazing. Um, so I'm, yeah, dude, it's all, it's all due to you though. I mean, this would not no, have happened. Not. So thank you for making Definitely this not. happen. I had it sitting on my, um, sitting on my desk at home and my desk sits out in, uh, the, one of the main living spaces and a friend comes over and she looks down and she says, Oh my goodness. That is the best book ever. Nice. Like I am such a fan of Jack Carr. And then she went on to talk for about two hours <laughs> about every single character awesome. and every single book. And she knew, and I was like, I wish you were there. I wish you were a fly on the wall uh -huh. just to listen because the level of impact, she's like, my son is an even bigger oh, fan man. and he's going to flip out to know that, you know, Jack Carr. Oh, and I'm man. like, oh my gosh, Jack Carr would flip out to hear yeah. you talking. So like, you know, encouragingly about this because oh, it's hard work, right? You, you've dedicated your life. This is, I mean, this is, this is like teams, man. You're putting it in. You, oh, yeah. yeah, it's difficult to be, uh, to be JC. It's, uh, it's pretty crazy these days, but I feel so fortunate, you know? Um, but I gotta, I have to get better. Like I need to go to the team performance Institute and learn more about leading myself and managing my time and prioritizing, uh, and all that sort of a thing, because it's, uh, it, it's pretty wild. It's felt, it's felt like uh, I was a startup and working out of the garage and then it yeah. starts to grow. And then you get to this point where you can't manage it out of your garage anymore. And you've got to move to, you know, the office park or something like that. And then start building it out and have employees yeah. that do things that you don't yeah. physically have to be doing. Maybe you don't have to right. be putting the, uh, you know, the electronic skateboard together, you know, by yourself in there. And then printing the package, your wife printing the packaging, you know, the, 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 putting it in and then sending it out and dealing with customer service or whatever it is. Uh, so it's time to, to get smarter about those things. And we're starting to, to do that. But, uh, but man, it's, it's, uh, I feel extremely fortunate. This last one I went and started renting Airbnbs around Park City so I could be yeah. the most efficient possible with my time. Because when you're sitting in one of the, I rented a little cabin and the cabin was just super tiny, but where the kitchen was, there was a, a little table right there. There's a wood burning stove. There's a bedroom, a bathroom and a deck and a pile of wood. So I could go outside and just chop wood, throw it into that wood burning yeah. stove. And I could still be thinking about the book, even if I walk the five steps it took to get to the refrigerator to grab a snack and then come sit back down. So it's constantly working. Um, with no yeah. interruptions, which is so yeah. key doing this sort of a thing, yeah. but, uh, I need to get out to team performance Institute. Uh, and yeah, speaking of, clearly. speaking of, you've been building this thing up now for, for a number of years. So now what's, yeah. uh, so I guess give me a little bit of background, um, yeah. uh, on team performance Institute and what you're passing along to these different, different yes. companies and then how people yeah. are finding out about you. And like, is a lot of word of mouth or how, how is this all, how has this all come together now? 
Yeah. Well, first, it's a dream, dream come true. Just like you. It was like started in the basement, right? I'm down there in the basement thinking, geez, this is my calling. Like you said, this is my mission. This is what I want to do. And I want to feed my family by doing what I'm passionately engaged. I was what I, and you know, for a couple of years, I was a one man kicking band in my basement. And I would do, you know, I'd go out and I would do talks with corporate corporate groups. Uh, a couple of good friends of mine took a couple of chances on me and said, Hey, we'd love for you to talk to, we have a new hire group coming out and we want to come, you know, can you come out and just talk to them about leadership? Cause they're all going to be in some type of leadership role. Sure. So I started doing that and it, and it grew. And then somebody said, Hey, you know, what else do you have? And I didn't really have anything else. And this is, I was still kind of working. I had a full-time job at the time and I decided, well, I'll, I'll go and get a get an executive coaching certification. So I can have a secondary like offering. Mm-hmm. So I started and I got certified as a, an executive performance coach. So now I can like not only go give speeches, but I can do executive coaching. So after I'm off the stage, people can call, you know, call me and say, I'd love you to be my executive coach. Cool. Uh, and so I started doing that. And then somebody said to me, well, can you do workshops? And I said, sure. No idea how to do that, but sure. The next day, I actually called one of my best friends who's army special forces guy. And I'm like, Hey, we got to do a workshop tomorrow. He's like, okay, let's figure this out. <laughs> nice. And we, uh, and he, you know, he taught at the center of enhanced human performance for West point. Wow. So uh, I make light of it, but we put together a phenomenal workshop and uh, we've tweaked on it. We said that we, we do a lot of workshops and then it just grew and grew and grew from there. It grew from me being one man kicking band to obviously getting your assistant and then getting an operations person and then getting a salesperson and building out a team. And then I just couldn't take on any more coaching clients. So I started bringing on more coaches. And then one of our biggest clients came to us and said, this is a godsend. I mean, this one was, this is me getting struck by lightning. In 2019, one of our biggest clients came to us and said, can you help us build a, a full scale leadership development program that we can teach? you know, uh, virtually because wow. we want you to do this globally for us for thir- in 13 different countries. Sure. We could do that. So I called the team in, we flew everybody in here to Cincinnati. And at that time we had about I think a dozen people came together, built a world-class and I'm, I'm bragging, uh, but it's true because it's been, it's been ranked as such a world-class leadership development nice. program that we can teach 100% virtually. It includes proprietary stuff that we've written, podcasts that I do with the executive teams of the companies we do, uh, coaching sessions with our coaches. And then we get together on Zoom calls like this or on WebEx and we get together and we work, you know, Jeez. work really tightly to, you know, help them help them come together. And this was, picture this, in 2019, going into 2020, we had to teach people to use this platform that nobody had heard of called Zoom. Yeah. In order to get off. And and all of a sudden, all of a sudden we're in the catbird seat. So when the pandemic hit and everybody was trying to figure out what to do with leadership development and training, you're already there. We sat there and we just kept on bringing in more and more clients. We were, we had a banner year in 2020 and uh, we continue to grow, continue to build. Um, And now we do all those things. We can still, we still do them. We have, it's not just me doing speeches. We have, uh, you know, female speakers, we have other male speakers, um, we do workshops virtually and in person, uh, executive leadership retreats. I just I've built this really fun team that I absolutely love. My team, I always say I'm the I'm the weakest link on my team, mm-hmm. and people laugh about that until they until they actually get on the website and they and they read the team bios. And they're like, whoa, hey man, you weren't kidding. You are the weakest link Stop on your team. There are some. I'm serious. There's some just incredible, incredible uh, folks that I get to work with on a daily basis. Amazing. Um, so yeah, honored. I just, you know, again, I put, uh, I put faith into, uh, into God to say, Hey, I want to try this. And I took a leap and, um, and it, and it paid off and it just, I mean, just continued to, to, and it's not, you know, the deal it's scary when you do that. It's hard when you do that. You took a huge leap to, you know, to try to be an author, not try, you crushed it, but you know, right out of the gate, but people would say, Oh, it was easy out of the gate. Like no problem. You just became yeah. this great <laughs> author. But yeah. They didn't see those two years of like, of <laughs> or the previous like, 40 of just being a fan, reading, knowing that's where I'm headed, yeah. but knowing what I like, what I don't like, like being a student of it my entire life, really. Right. Yeah. And for those listening, think about like the angst of somebody who spends 40 years of their life, works so hard to become who they are, and then decides at that moment, I'm going to try my best to do something. And I hope the world accepts it. 
And if it doesn't, it feels like you're all in oh, on your true character. You, you push yourself forward on the table. Hey, this is me and I'm all in. And for you and for me, Jack, thank God the world said we're in. Like we're, we want to be a part of this. And so I, I just, you know, I think it's, again, just it's a wonderful story of your story just really inspires me to do more, to be more and to get after. Oh man, you're so awesome. Um, gosh. Yeah. It, before that, that is a great place to end it, but I want to ask you one more thing because I, I, I've talked to <laughs> friends who have done not similar, I guess, similar things, I guess, but they name their company or their group, like let's say their last name. Um, so it's mm-hmm. the whatever group. Um, and then they've had a hard time having other people under that banner come and talk because people want the name in the group, the one person that right. is the face of, of the company, uh, that they see right. on, on news for their two minute and 30 second, like, you know, talking about something in the world or whatever it might be. Sure. Um, and they want that person. And so a few people I know out there, um, have struggled, even if it's not a leadership type of a thing, if it's, uh, talking about, uh, you know, military and tactics and strategies and cultures and how all that comes together when you're working with the counterinsur- and counterinsurgency type of an environment. And, and that sort of a thing. They want the person. They didn't want the person underneath the person to come out because you feel like yeah. you got shortchanged yeah. or something like that. Um, <laughs> so, so I know a couple of people have had a hard time dealing with that, but it seems like you have not had that issue. And I think a lot of it is team performance institute. You start it with team. It's not the, you know, That's it's right. not the Sanchez group. It's not the, you know, the Sanchez team. That's it's right. team performance institute. Uh, and I'm curious yep. about uh, about that. Or did you ever run into that issue? Or did you, did you have that forethought? Or was it just natural that, hey, team performance institute, and it so happened to work out where your name is yeah. not attached to it and everyone is not only wanting you, which is what I've seen yes. happen with some other people. Yeah, no, I've seen that too. And, and um, it was purposeful. It was very purposeful. I'd say, honestly, it comes from me not r- realizing that when, when, or if this did build out, that that was the direction it needed to go. But I also didn't feel like, I don't know. I just didn't feel like I could, I could really put, it didn't feel natural for me to put the, my name on it. Boom. And that's, you know, that's, because then it all has to be you. Right. Not only did I, I think we're just a collection, like I'm just a collection of all the experiences that I've had. So if you go back earlier in the podcast, we're talking about like, you know, my military experience, I grew up and I was inspired to go to the military and then I was in sales and then I was in corporate leadership. Well, there's 25 years of like kind of studying leadership. It all kind of blends together into one big you know, one big mural of cool experiences. If I can package that and give it back to the world, great. But it's not just me. It's not just my eyes. It's not just my view. The power is always within the team. I can, with people like you in my life, I knew I could bring people into this to create all different perspectives and whole different, like holistic training for others. And that's not going to come straight out of the SEAL teams. Like there's, yeah. I am 100% fan of the SEAL teams. I love it. It helps us, you know, kind of kick in the door with, with certain corporations or companies. So that's, that's elite training. Um, but my goal actually over the five years from what I started to write about now was let's try to filter some of the military-esque training out of this and really get into the neuropsychology of human performance. I mean, it will always be in me. I will always be deep down military it runs through my veins, my culture, where I grew up, how I grew up, all the experiences I've had. And in Team, team Performance Institute, you know, we got about 20 people, 10 of them are military veterans, but we also have, you know, six PhDs, a couple PsyDs. We got people who got their master's in adult education, very diverse around. And I learned so much from both sides of those equations. Like we have pilots, you know, with us, we have SEALs, we have special forces guys. We got coaches who don't have corporate experience that are grandmas and they are some of the best coaches that you can possibly imagine they come at it with such a cool angle so i always saw it as an opportunity again to not only impact those that become part of our training but for me now is to help impact those who are part of the institute those who who come to us and want to work for us and build uh, build out their lives. I, I, I'm wholly committed to them because they bring cool perspectives that I could never bring. I'm not talented enough to be anybody other than me. Yeah. Well, right. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of talent bottled up there, my friend. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> it takes one to know oh, one, Jack. man. Oh, dude. I- Man, I'm so fired up for you. And, and with people listening to this or watching, however, however it is, um, I mean, they'll get the sense like you are a good person and you are a solid 
dude. And surrounding yourself, I think you mentioned it earlier on, uh, about surrounding yourself with good people and how important that is, um, whether it's professionally or personally. Um, and sometimes you can have a collision there, but have personally and professionally surrounding yourself with good, positive people who, uh, who add value to your life and not value by monetary value. Uh, I don't mean that at all, but I just mean add value, keeping you moving forward and you in turn doing the same for them. Um, however large or small that group is or that, that circle may be, but having those positive impacts on people and people will be able to tell that you are that, you are that person. Everybody wants to, to be around you, give off this positive energy. Um, and, uh, it's infectious. And uh, it's something I've always admired about you. And people can tell whether they're listening or they spend time with you in person. It's the same. It's the same deal. Uh, you're authentic and real and true and loyal and honest and just and positive and add value to everyone's life uh, whose path you cross. So, man, I just want to thank you for for everything you've done for for me, for my family, for the country. And I'm just so excited that you are passing these lessons along, experiences along, and helping others. Um, and you've mentioned it naturally so many times. You were just helping others. Uh, at every stage of your life and to include now with the Team Performance Institute. So, man, thank you for everything. Thanks, Jack. I appreciate it. You know I love you. You know I love your family. And I'm just such, just so honored to be just, a, you know, on, the, on this podcast with you and honored to be a, a small part of the story. So I look forward to many more years. And uh, here's, to, here's the memories we're going to make, my friend. Absolutely, brother. Thank you Cheers for everything. You, hopefully I'll see you Can't in person soon. More. Yes, sir. All right, take care, brother. <laughs> The home buying experience can be a daunting one. Navy Federal Credit Union is here to help military members and their families tackle home ownership. They offer mortgage options with zero down payment, so you don't need to wait years to save. They offer mortgage options that don't require private mortgage insurance, so you'll save money each and every month. Members save $2,500 on average when they choose Navy Federal for their mortgage. With resources like Realty Plus, you can get an experienced real estate agent and Navy Federal is a top VA home lender. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. Insured by NCUA, an equal housing lender. I want to thank my friends at Black Rifle Coffee for sponsoring the Danger Close podcast. I've been a huge fan for the longest time. Drink Black Rifle Coffee every day. And if you keep your eyes peeled, you will notice that perhaps Chris Pratt is wearing a Black Rifle Coffee t-shirt, not unsimilar to this one in the Amazon series adaptation of the Terminal List. Now you can go to blackriflecoffee.com slash danger close and use code danger close 20 at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. Black Rifle Coffee, America's Coffee, keep crushing. Today's gear segment is sponsored by Schnees. And go to schnees.com, check out all they have going on. They have a ton of great things on their website. Uh, check them out on Instagram. But today I want to talk about boots because I love everything that they have going on up there, but I probably have 10 different pairs of their boots. But I started with these right here, the granites. And I love these boots. I got my first elk in these, uh, muzzleloader hunt, New Mexico, about a decade ago. These are the exact same boots right here. So they have some miles on them. They have been to uh, Alaska after bear, wolf, uh, moose, and I just love these boots. So if I go into the back country and I have some weight on my back and I'm planning on coming out even a little heavier, then these are the boots that I take. I was wearing these in Kamchatka, Russia on a bear hunt where I went to do some research for Savage Sun. And for those of you who know Savage Sun, that's my third novel in the James Reese series. And uh, you know, a lot of it takes place there. And then there's a little story that I fictionalized and dropped into Alaska in that, uh, in that story near kind of closer to the beginning, but these are the boots that I wore. Absolutely love these boots right here and love all the people at Schnee's and just can't say enough good things about them, but they are handcrafted in their Italian boot factory. That's right. You'll find no mass production machinery. They're just a team of world-class boot makers doing their thing. Schnee's only sells boots directly to you, the consumer. This means there is no middleman markup like other boot companies out there. That means that they can put higher emphasis on the materials that go into their boots and you get more boot for the money. Higher quality materials and more boot for the money. From the leathers to the tread, every Schnee's boot is made from the absolute finest materials available. 
backed by Schnee's industry-leading customer service and support. If you have a question or need a solid boot recommendation for your hunt, give them a call. You'll actually get a person on the line who wears the boots and is ready to help. There are a lot of boots out there uh, in their lineup, so definitely give them a call. Let them know what you're going to be doing, and they can make a recommendation for you. When you shop at, shop at schnees.com, that is S-C-H-N-E-E-S.com, make sure you use the promo code JACK21. When you do, you'll get 10% off your pair of Schnee's boots and logo wear. Again, that is S-C-H-N-E-E-S.com, promo code JACK21. These handmade hunting boots usually sell out fast, so grab your pair today. Take care of your feet. Don't compromise. Upgrade to Schnee's today. Welcome to the gear highlight portion of the Danger Close podcast. I want to talk about Direct Action USA today. You can go to directactionusa.com, check out all the metal artwork they have going on. They make me these bookmarks. These are the metal bookmarks that you can find on the website, jackcarusa.com, 556 round right there. Nothing better to keep your place in a Jack Car novel than one of these, but they make a ton of other stuff on there as well. Veteran owned and operated, family owned and operated, just great people. And uh, they sent me, this is so amazing. I was just blown away. So they sent me these, these are metal and uh, they're going to go in the the hallway that leads down to this podcast studio. Um, They're just incredible. So book covers in metal and uh, just too cool. And they sent them not just for one book, but for all books. There you go. I can see that right there. And, uh, so direct action USA. Thank you guys so much. Um, I mean, when I started the the merch site, the bookmarks right here, one of the first things that, uh, that I wanted on there. So I just knew I needed something, something different. And I've given these as gifts to my, to my kids before, uh, there was ever a, a merch site or anything like that. I just love what you guys are, are doing over there. Um, the last book right here, look at that. I mean, every single one to include, the latest in the blood right there. So uh, Direct Action USA, thank you guys so much. You've been awesome and I love everything you have going on. So anybody who's watching or listening, directactionusa.com. Check them out. Thank you for tuning into the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. To find out more about John Sanchez, go to teamperformanceinstitute.com. Check out all they have going on. Can't recommend John Sanchez and his team enough. Uh, What an incredible human being. If you enjoyed that conversation, be sure to leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. That's Apple, Spotify, or the Jack Carr YouTube channel. You can go to my website, officialjackcar.com. You can go check out jackcarusa.com for the merch and follow me on the social channels, Jack Car USA. Thank you so much for tuning in. It means the world. Sincerely appreciated. Take care out there. Be safe. Stay strong. Keep fighting.